أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف خلقه وخاتم أنبيائه وسيد رسله نبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين المكرمين Respected brothers and sisters, salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The more we delve into the Holy Quran, the more the realization emerges of the importance of understanding the relevance of the certain verses in relation to its interpretation, as well as the fact that the Quran by no means contradicts itself. Meaning that some people out there today who have attempted to study the Quran outside the kind of Muslim perspective or the Islamic perspective have come forward with a number of misconceptions. Seemingly looking at certain verses in the Quran, then looking at other parts of the holy book and deriving a conclusion that certain verses are not matching or on line with the other or in line with other verses. And so they will present the argument that there are so-called problems in the Quran. How can it be the word of God if at one instance he says something, at another instance he says something else? Let me give you an example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that the human being, the male, is permitted to marry more than one wife, up to four. Yet, there, are also, there is also a verse in the Quran in which the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala says, um, That the condition that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed for this particular act, the polygamy, is that there must be justice. And of course, this idea of adala is discussed in detail in Islamic jurisprudence. But another verse says, you will not be just, you will not be able to be just between your wives, even if you tried. So what you find is that people will come forward and take these verses and say, well, one verse says you can marry up to four, as long as you exercise justice. Another verse says you will not be able to practice adala. So somehow these two can't be reconciled and they may come with a particular conclusion. Of course, for that example, there are answers. One being is that the idea of justice is different in the sense that here the Quran is talking about the inability to share one's feelings exactly or the love that one may have with their wives. On the other instance, the justice is with regards to the time spent, the finances, and so on and so forth. And hence, we need hadith from the Holy Prophet and the Ma'asumim, peace and blessings be upon them, to explain this so-called uh, uh, problem, so to speak, or dilemma that exists. Now, one area which has been the subject, again, of such discussions is the uh, notion or the belief in shafa'a, intercession. The Holy Quran comes forward with many verses which points to a reality, and that's intercession happening on the Day of Judgment, at least. And other verses seemingly pointing the opposite direction. So, for example, in Surah Taha, the subject or the chapter of our discussion, in verse 109, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, on that day, shafa'a will not be of any avail. It will not be useful. It will not come to any fruition, so to speak, if we just look at it in that way. Then you also have other verses in the Holy Quran as well. So, for example, in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 254, you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala once again, points to this particular idea. He says that on that day, 
يوم لا بيع فيه ولا خلة ولا شفاعة. But on the day of judgment, there is no buying and selling, no friendship, no intercession. So can you get even more explicit than this verse that says, on the day of judgment, there is no, so to speak, intercession. Whereas, of course, we have in the Holy Quran itself, in this particular verse, the next one, which is known as Ayat al-Kursi, what do you find? مَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يَشْفَعُ عِنْدَهُ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here that it is he who allows certain individuals to intercede with his permission. So there is a permission to intercede. And in another verse, like the one before, seemingly there is no intercession. And there are many such examples. If you look at uh, also Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 40, وَلَا يَقْبَلُ مِنْهَا شَفَاعَةً Allah says the shafa'ah is not accepted. You look at Surah Al-Muddathir, فَمَا تَنْفَعَهُمْ شَفَاعَةُ الشَّافِعِينَ That the shafa'ah of the intercessors, their intercession will not be useful. And so on. So here is the paradox, so to speak, and the idea that we need to somehow clarify. In order to understand the whole concept of shafa'ah, as briefly as we can for the purposes of this discussion, we need to delve into it in some detail. This area has been sub, uh, mentioned um, approximately 30 times in the Holy Quran, across 30 different places. You find the reference to the concept of shafa'a. Now in Arabic, a shafa'a means uh, something which is a pair. So bringing, it, uh, bringing two things together, so to speak. It's from al shafa'a. You know, in uh, Salatul Layl, we have the Ruk'atayn, al-Shafi' and we have al-Witr. In Arabic, Witr means one. Shafi' means when you put two things together. Yes, you bring two things uh, together, something to another. In the contemporary usage, in the Arabic language, when somebody says, I am seeking your Shafa'a, so we're not talking about the Quranic usage of it, in the Arabic language terminology, so to speak. It refers to the idea of going to someone who has influence over someone else in order to convince that other person to change their mind about a decision or an act or a process. So for example, we may have somebody who wish, wishes to sell a house. Yeah? You want to go and buy this house, but the person is not willing to sell the house. He's refusing to sell the house for, to you, for example. You go to someone who is close to that person and you say to them, can you have a word for me on my behalf? Maybe they'll listen to you. Maybe they'll change their mind and they'll sell the house to me, for example. That individual that you've gone to is a shafi'a, the one who intercedes so to speak, so that the other person changes his opinion. And what would he do? Normally, he would use emotion, right? He would go and say, you know what, I have a friend. I think he's a good person. I think it would be really good if you sell the house to him. I can vouch for him. I think, you know, he's reliable, he's trustworthy. So it's either sometimes uh, positive reinforcement, sometimes it could be negative. And I say, you know, if you don't, I won't do this, or I will withdraw, or I won't be friends with you. You know, there are always different ways in which people utilize to get to where they wish to get. It's all about changing the opinion of the person who we know has the final decision about something. That's what it means, yes? Or helping influence their decision. Not necessarily changing their decision, but, for example, they are uh, granting us some kind of a, a, a permission to, to do something, and we need to make sure that that happens, so we seek some assistance. Quranic principle of shafa'a is not this. And unfortunately, unfortunately, we have people who have misunderstood this area, who have not figured it out 
according to the understanding that we have from the teachings of the Ahl al-Bayt and the opinions of the ulama, this is the incorrect understanding. Let me highlight how it's incorrect by giving you a story. It's mentioned that uh, uh, an Iranian scholar by the name of Allama Yasiri, he saw a man, a poet, uh, by the name of Hajib. And this poet used to recite poetry to people. He used to say to people, O oh people, if you have a good relationship with Ali ibn Abi Talib, then you're safe on the day of judgment. Sin as much as you want. And he says that this Hajib, one day in his dream, he saw Amir al-Mu'mineen. Amir al-Mu'mineen said to him, go back and change your poem. And say, if you have a relationship, good relationship with Ali ibn Abi Talib, be embarrassed and shamed not to sin. And it's completely different, isn't it? One is some kind of a lethargic, you know, very relaxed attitude that, you know what, there'll be intercession for me on the day of judgment, so I'll get away with it. And the other, no, places the emphasis on the person themselves, on an active process of transformation and striving and struggling. And there's a very fine, clear difference between them. So, the reason why the Quranic notion of shafa'a is not what we describe is quite clear. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not err. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not necessarily in that area change his mind, so to speak. Yes, he doesn't need someone to come and tell him something. He says, you know what? Hmm, never thought of that. I'll change my mind and I'll forgive that particular person or raise them to paradise or so on and so forth. It's not the same. That's not the Quranic understanding or the Quranic presentation of shafa'a. But rather, it's about the individual preparing themselves and crucially becoming entitled for and deserving of attaining forgiveness. Very important that we ponder over this point. We have one of our scholars uh, Sayyid al-Murtada, Allah Ta'ala al-Maqama, he says, he says, حَقِيقَةُ الشَّفَاعَةَ طَلَبُوا إِسْقَاطُ الْعَذَابِ عَنْ مُسْتَحَقِّهِ The reality of shafa'a in reality is to seek forgiveness from the sins and the punishments associated with the sin for those who deserve the punishment. So, in essence, that's what people intercede or seek intercession for. And if we look at what the Qur'an says in across the various different verses, we begin to understand that the shift and the focus is placed upon the believer, the individual themselves, rather than a simple idea of, I'll sin and I'll hope that somebody out there who I am associating myself with will intercede and will be the cause of my Forgiveness. Now, if you examine the Qur'an, you'll find that three key factors are found in the process of shafa'a that must be present in order for intercession to actually occur. And these three must be understood. And when we understand them, we can then interpret these other verses that seemingly give an idea that there will be no intercession. Very, very critical and crucial for us to ponder over this. The first is the type of wrongdoing that people are seeking shafa'a for. So if we come to the conclusion that mainly the shafa'a and intercession is sought for forgiveness, essentially, the type of transgressions and disobedience that we are seeking forgiveness for must be understood, number one. And we'll elaborate on these three points in a minute. Number two, the person who seeks the shafa'a, the individual, must also possess certain qualities and attributes. And thirdly, the intercessor, the shafi', also must have certain qualities. So once these three are understood, we can have a better idea of what shafa'a in reality is. Now, first, the type of wrongdoings. The Quran tells us, وَمَا 
للظالمين من حميم ولا شفيع القرآن says the oppressors will never get شفاعه so we are told in in uh, uh, the Quran as well as in narrations there are certain types of sins that if the human being performs it and commits it will not be the recipient of intercession zulm is one oppression second hypocrisy nifaq third hatred of the prophet and the ahlul bayt and nasab or the nawasib fourth those who deny the day of judgment al mukadhibina bi yawm din or the actual denial of the day of judgment fifth uh, those who hurt or injure or stand against the ahlul bayt including those who kill the ahlul bayt seven to deny arrogantly the wilaya of Amir al-Mu'mineen, al-Jahideen bi wilayati Ali, and eight, al-Mukadhibeen bi shafa'a, those who reject the concept of shafa'a. In other words, the act of the rejection of the concept of shafa'a is a sin that shafa'a in itself will not help. So that's the type of action, number one. Number two, the people, the person seeking the shafa'ah. The Quran tells us that there must be an important quality, and that's iman. We find in the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا يملكون الشفاعة إلا من اتخذ عند الرحمن عهدا. The shafa'ah will not reach anyone except that they have a covenant with God. What is that covenant? We have a hadith from the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Narrated in Musnad Ahmad. The hadith says, يَشْفَعُ الْأَنْبِيَاءُ فِي كُلِّ مَنْ كَانَ يَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ مُخْلِصًا That the prophets will intercede for anyone who says لا إله إلا الله sincerely. Therefore, we are told that an important quality of the individual seeking shafa'a is iman and islam that's why the famous narration that is found right next to the holy shrine of the prophet in masjid al-nabawi in medina very big and people can see it where it is narrated the prophet of islam says famously shafa'ati li ahli al-kaba'ir min ummati that my shafa'a will reach the people of my own ummah who have perpetrated and committed big, larger, greater sins. So therefore, it is exclusive to those who have the covenant of belief, and that is the religion of Islam. And the reason being for this is, you might ask, but why? Why can't there be shafa'a for the non-believers? And the reason is, this is a very critical point, there needs to be a connection between the person seeking the shafa'a and the shafi'a. That the idea is that if there is no connection between these two, then you cannot seek the shafa'a. This connection is iman and faith. This connection is belief, isn't it? So there must be a relationship that exists between the individual who are seeking the shafa'a and the shafi'a. Otherwise, shafa'a will not be taking place. Who can intercede? Shafa'a belongs to the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala exclusively. There is no doubt it's He who grants it to whomsoever He wishes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ لِلَّهِ الشَّفَاعَةُ جَمِيعًا In the Quran says, to Allah belongs shafa'a completely. However, as we read in Surah Taha here, Illa man adhina lahu rahman There are people whom the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant permission on the Day of Judgment to intercede for people. Taking into consideration point number one and point number two, the types of actions and the type of people. And Allah chooses these people due to the fact that they know who to intercede for and who not to intercede for.
So the key thing is uh, to understand based on these three points, if we go back to these verses that seemingly give a, an idea which is um, that people think it's contradictory in the Quran with regards to whether intercession takes place or does not, we can understand it with this in mind. For example, in Surah Al-Baqarah, when we see the, the verse that says, وَلَا يُقْبَلُ مِنْهَا شَفَاعَةً That the shafa'a of that soul will not be accepted. Or if uh, that, that individual's request for shafa'a will not be accepted. And that, according to the Mufassireen, is the request for the non-believers for shafa'a. So you can see it, when you read it, well, it's general. It says it will not be accepted. It's request for intercession is rejected. But if you look at the world of hadith and you put the general understanding of what shafa'a is all together, you come to that particular conclusion. And likewise, when you look at the verses that we've just referred to here, for example, in 254, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, on that day, there is no selling, there is no buying, so to speak, no friendship, and there is no shafa'a. This shafa'a is in reference to a group of individuals, is in reference to certain characteristics. And these verses are allegorical, they are metaphorical, they are not uh, the, the, the verses that we understand on the superficial level, but they need to be interpreted and understood from the other verses in the Quran supported by the world of hadith. And that's why you find that, for example, people ask the question, who intercedes on the Day of Judgment? Is it just the Prophets? Is it just the Ahlul Bayt? Well, no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who grants permission to whomsoever he wishes. And so the circle of the intercession or the intercessors is quite wide. We have a hadith from the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his progeny, says, ثَلَاثَةٌ يَشَّفَّعُونَ إِلَى اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ فَيُشَفَّعُونَ There are three groups of people on the Day of Judgment, they will intercede to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah will allow them to intercede. الْأَنْبِيَاء وَالْعُلَمَاء وَالشُّهَدَاء The prophets, the scholars and the martyrs, they will intercede. Then we have a beautiful hadith uh, that is narrated by Shaykh Al-Mufid in Al-Ikhtisas, um, which states, it's from Imam Al-Sadiq alayhi salam, إِذَا كَانَ يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ بَعَثَ اللَّهُ الْعَالِمُ وَالْعَابِدُ On the day of judgment, as an example, Allah will resurrect the abid, the worshipper of God, and the scholar, the alim. فَإِذَا وَقَفَ بَيْنَ يَدِي اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ قِيلَ لِلْعَابِدْ إِنْطَلِقْ إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ When they stand before Allah, the message is delivered to the worshipper of God, go to paradise. So what happens to the scholar? وَقِيلَ لِلْعَالِمْ قِفْ Wait. تَشَفَّعْ لِلنَّاسِ بِحُسْنِ تَأْدِيبِكَ لَهُمْ Wait. You are one of the intercessors. You can intercede for people because you've trained them well. Look at the last part. You have taught them well. Simply the idea of anybody attaining shafa'a just because they claim to be, for example, believers or claim to subscribe to the following of the Ahl al-Bayt or anything like that according to the Qur'an and the sound authentic narrations is not an acceptable notion. That's why on the last final moments of the, uh, of the life of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, when he gathered his family members, and perhaps it's very well known, he said to people, لَن تَنَالُوا شَفَاعَتُنَا مَنْ اسْتَخَفَّ بِصَلَاتِهِ Whomsoever takes their prayers lightly will not receive our intercession. Again, goes back to the individual themselves. You know, because there's a dangerous movement out there. And I've mentioned this before. I remember once going to a mosque in the West. I wouldn't even mention which country it was in fear of knowing where it is. And I was told that, you know, can you please speak about the importance of praying? I was surprised. You know, normally we speak about concentration in prayer. Sometimes we talk about effective means to enhance our prayer. We normally speak to the children about the importance of praying and not to the adults or the elders. But I was requested to do so. And when I investigated further, I came to the idea that there are people out there 
who have the opinion and are stating it that simply being or being a follower of Ali ibn Abi Talib and loving Amir al-Mu'mineen and the Ahl al-Bayt is sufficient and that prayer is not necessary because ultimately it is all about wilaya and wilaya gets you to Jannah. But this is rejected in the Quran, it's rejected and the teachings of Ahl al-Bayt themselves uh, is quite clearly rejected. The station of wilaya is significant and important but it is understood through the correct following of the Ahl al-Bayt. And that means that we look after our prayers and our wajibat and stay away from the muharramat as that particular dream of that poet quite clearly demonstrated. It is about being embarrassed before the Ahl al-Bayt of committing these kind of sins rather than going there and thinking, you know what, I am your follower, here you go, take me out of my difficulty. Now the key thing is though, you might ask a question, okay, but if you, try, if you are a good person and you do righteous deeds and stay away from uh, forbidden acts, why would you need intercession anyway? The answer to this is we all slip up. We all make mistakes. But there is a difference between an individual who takes sinning lightly and continuously commits acts of disobedience and transgression and has a false sense of security and hope. False sense. Yes? And an, an individual who know, tries hard, repents, strives, continuously self-scrutinizes, but still is in need because, you know, on the day of judgment, we may, and it's likely that many of us have committed acts that we are not aware of, perhaps the severity of it. One word that we might have said against people that have influenced or negatively impacted masses sometimes. Uh, we may have taken the rights of some people away without knowing or even acts that we have taken lightly that are great or big in the eyes of Allah. So it is for those individuals who are seeking that uh, enlightenment and that success in Akhirah but are striving hard and are working towards achieving self-purification as much as possible. Now, one final area we need to perhaps look at is the question regarding the difference between tawassul and shafa'ah. Because, of course, the Quran speaks about tawassul. Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, ittaqullaha wa abtagu ilayhi al-wasila. Seek a means of nearness to him. And many Muslims, uh, include Sunnis and Shias, they believe or the concept of tawassul simply means you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this world through some holy individuals. And you ask, the, knowing that Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one, is the absolute perfect being, is the Lord, who is the power, who is independent. Everyone else, everything else, so to speak, is dependent upon him. Tawassul, therefore, is suggested to be the seeking of intercession. In English, is translated as intercession too. And so is shafa'a. So tawassul is seen to be seeking intercession in this world, in this existence. Whereas shafa'a is deemed to be that which occurs in the day of judgment. Having said that, there are certain opinions that come forward and say, well, Quranically, there isn't much of a difference. That they're both somehow the same. They can be interchangeable. The terms are interchangeable. And... Uh, you know, the tawassul is the same as shafa'a and likewise, but it is likely to conform to the first opinion that we spoke about. And certainly some verses in the Qur'an which point to shafa'a not taking place on the Day of Judgment can be understood in reference to the fact that the polytheists used to believe that idols intercede for them, used to believe that these idols will come to their help on the Day of Judgment. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would say that no, these idols are useless, they will never be of any help to you as intercessors on the Day of Judgment in any shape or form. When we look at um, the Qur'an here in chapter 20, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِلَّا مَنْ أَذِنَ لَهُ الرَّحْمَنُ وَرَضِيَ لَهُ قَوْلًا that the condition for the acceptance, so to speak, of the shafa'a 
is the permission from the Almighty Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And Allah Tabaraka Wa Ta'ala knows as a creator of everything and all, He knows that, for example, certain of His creation are suited and are uh, uh, creations that have been given this permission to intercede based on the fact that what they speak is in line with the teachings of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, next verse in 110, يَعْلَمُ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمَا خَلْفَهُمْ He knows what is before them and what is behind them. This idea is in reference to the comprehensive knowledge of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala's knowledge is not deficient in any shape or form. His knowledge fully encapsulates everything, the past and the future. In chapter 3, verse number 5, Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala says, لا يخفى عليه شيء في الأرض ولا في السماء There is nothing in the heavens or in the earth that is missed by the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in chapter 20, uh, verse 98, which we discussed a few weeks ago, the last verse in reference to the story of Musa alayhi salam, the verse says, إِنَّمَا إِلَاهُكُمُ الَّذِي لَا إِلَاهَ إِلَّا هُ وَسِعَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ عِلْمًا Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala encapsulates everything in his knowledge. Now, some have said this A.D. him, he knows ma bayna A.D. him wa ma khalfahum. This A.D. him means dunya, oh sorry, A.D. him means akhira, and khalfahum means dunya, what they have left behind. Remember, this is uh, explaining one of the uh, uh, stations, so to speak, or one of the images that we get about the day of reckoning, the day of measure and accountability, so to speak. And that description is further encouraging of the understanding of the fact that nothing is missed by the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. And only those individuals who constantly are aware of his presence will appreciate this particular emphasis by the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala because, of course, many of the uh, human beings are forgetful and despite knowing that the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala is closer to them than their jugular vein and nothing is missed by him when they are by themselves or when perhaps they have uh, other temptations and they feel the need to commit certain acts which are prohibited, they forget this important realization either deliberately or uh, not. This pronoun, which is ma bayna aydihim wa ma khalfahum, who is it referring to? Some of us Sireen said it refers to the intercessors because the last verse says, Shafa'a will not be obtained except by those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given permission to intercede. So now they say, Ya'lamu ma bayna aydihim. This him refers to the intercessors. Wa ma khalfahum. In reference to those who have been given permission to intercede. But it is more likely, according to many Mufassiri, that this is not in reference to the uh, intercessors, but more the wrongdoers, the mujrimin, that the Quran spoke about a few verses earlier and then went on to talk about how they speak by themselves very quietly and so on. وَنَحْشُرُ الْمُجْرِمِينَ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ زُرْقَ So it's the wrongdoers, the sinners. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they need to realize and they need to have an understanding that their past and their present and everything Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala encapsulates about them. Despite the fact that of course they denied that because if they knew it and they'd acted upon it, they wouldn't be of the mujrimin. They're one of the mujrimin because they've committed acts against Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala, transgressions, knowing that he knows, knowing that he's watching them. So, the Almighty says, I know, I know everything. You know, today in a court case, we have a judge, 
and we have the jury, and we have evidence being presented. And sometimes evidence is not conclusive. Sometimes people believe it's conclusive. Later on, the truth emerges. How many people have been imprisoned wrongly and then freed after so many years and so on and so forth. Sometimes the criminals are not imprisoned or not sentenced due to lack of sufficient evidence, isn't it? In today's world, that's what happens. Allah Taala says, forget that kind of justice. On the day of judgment, nothing is missed. On the day of judgment, today we might have a judge who may not know all the laws and may make a mistake in the judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, will act with justice and if he wishes so, with his mercy. However, nothing is missed when it comes to the passing of the judgment of the human beings. وَلَا يُحِيطُونَ بِهِ عِلْمًا Now, he knows everything about them. They have no ability to have any grasp of his knowledge or understanding of what he knows. It also could mean that they themselves have no idea about their past or their present. So for example, they've wasted it. They didn't really plan for it. They had no knowledge of the future, what will happen that helped them or the, even Possibly that they had the knowledge, but they rejected it or did not necessarily take it into consideration. In Arabic, anat is from al-anwa. Now, al-anwa is in reference to humility, humbleness, al-khudu'. And in Arabic language, another word that's used to refer to a prisoner, al-asir, is al-ani. Why? Because when you capture someone as a captive, they're fairly weak, they're humble, they can't really do much, and they perhaps stand before you with humility, um, not with any power or strength, because they feel like they're fair, lies with the person who's captured them, so to speak. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, once again, and these are verses that describe some uh, features of the Day of Judgment and what happens to people on that day, says that the faces of certain individuals will be very humbled and will signify their weakness and humility. Why the faces? وَعَنَةِ wujuh. The answer simply is that the face is the clearest form of emotion, uh, the expression of the emotion, isn't it? You'll be able to find out how somebody feels by looking at their face, not anywhere else in their body. And so the Quran points to this as emotions are reflected in the face. But observe how continuously in the last few verses, and in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala points to the strength and the might and the power and the majesty of the Almighty and the weakness of the human being. This is a reminder continuously because you see sometimes in this world, human beings believe that they own everything and that they are the masters of everything, God forbid, and their level of arrogance and self-centeredness and takabbur sometimes leaves people uh, who observe this thinking, hasn't this individual ever reflected about their past, their present, their future? Harun al-Abbasi was a, uh, an individual who falls under the category of people who used to deny the true characteristics of a believer, so to speak, and practiced much arrogance and uh, was a tyrant. One day, somebody came to him to visit him. And you see, this is what happens with certain individuals. If they don't have fear of God, they begin to develop fear of human beings at the expense of the fear of God. And then they'll start saying things 
just to please that human being, which becomes problematic and sometimes blasphemous. It is narrated that somebody came to him and said to him, Assalamu alayka ya Rasulallah. He said to him, Peace be upon you, O Messenger of God. And someone else came to him, of course, seeking wealth, seeking some kind of remuneration. Someone else came to him and says, uh, and recited lines of poetry in Arabic. He says to him, ma shi'ta ma sha'atil aqdaru. Whatever you wish happens. Fahkum fa'anta al-wahidu al-qahharu. Rule because you are the one almighty powerful. Shirk, direct, says to Harun, you are the mighty or powerful. So Harun says, give him some money, this poet. The, uh, those who are around in the uh, gathering or the majlis, so to speak, of Harun say, as soon as that poet, poet received his wealth and stepped down, there was a, a fly that came and sat on the nose of Harun. And Harun tried to push it, but it kept annoying this individual until he was in a constant battle with it. Without realizing, because he was in, in such a way, he fell a few steps from his throne all the way onto the ground before everyone else. So can you see someone came to him and said, you are the all-powerful, almighty, rule whatever you like. And a simple fly humiliated him before everyone else, isn't it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as Imam Sadiq once said to the Mansur, Mansur was also annoyed by a fly. And Mansur Dawaniqi said to Imam Sadiq, why did God create these creatures? They're annoying. Imam Sadiq replies and says, so that they can humble the worst of tyrants. They can teach them a lesson. You know, you think you're great, but you can't even protect yourself against a small creation of God, such as a fly. This idea of wujuh is quite interesting. I would like to uh, perhaps end the discussion this evening by looking at this concept in the Holy Quran, because... You find it in uh, many verses where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the faces and uses the term or the name, the pronoun wujuh, yes, in reference to the faces of the human being. For example, we have in chapter 3, in verse 106, Allah ta'ala tells us of the color now, this is not in any shape or form describing a color in relation to human beings in this world, yes? This is not to say any reference to any person with a particular color here will be like so on the Day of Judgment. No, not at all. But Allah wa ta'ala is using a color as a metaphor for this grace that happens only on the Day of Judgment. So, in uh, verse 106 of uh, Surah Ali Imran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yawma tabiyaddu wujuhun wa taswaddu wujuh. That day, the faces, some of them will be bright and illuminating and some will be darkened. Now, darkened, it could refer to the idea of uh, a, a sign in it that shows that they are of the doomed individuals. They are of the people who have indeed... Uh, wrong themselves and are uh, the losers, so to speak. And of course, the Quran tells us, فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ سُوَدَّتْ وُجُوهُهُمْ أَكَفَرْتُمْ بَعْدَ إِيمَانِكُمْ فَذُوقُوا الْعَذَابَ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَكْفُرُونَ Likewise, another verse that talks about the faces is in chapter 8, verse, uh, verse 50. Allah here talks about the punishment. Uh, where he says, وَلَوْ تَرَى إِذْ يَتَوَفَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا الْمَلَائِكَةِ The malaika come and take away the souls of the non-believers. يَضْرِبُونَ وُجُوهَهُمْ وَأَدْبَارَهُمْ They strike them in their faces and as well as their backs. So the striking that happens according to narrations is not just a slap, so to speak. It is ferocious, it's quite painful, excruciatingly difficult, but it's done with fire in, in that sense. And so the Quran says that individuals who disbelieve arrogantly will be subjected to this type of punishment on their faces. Again, a lot of people 
care much about their faces, isn't it? It's, what, it's the appearance of the human being. So they'll do everything possible to make sure it is something that pre it's presented in the best possible way. The Quran says, well, it could be a source of happiness for human beings. And it's also possibly a, a source of damnation. And that's why you look at, or a, a way to identify damnation. You look at the Quran in uh, uh, chapter 75, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وُجُوهٌ يَوْمَ إِذٍ نَاظِرَةٌ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهَا نَاظِرَةٌ This is a verse that has been unfortunately misunderstood by certain Muslim theological schools of thought where they say that on the Day of Judgment people look at God. Of course, we believe we cannot see God. God is not visible by the eyes because that is limiting Him. He's the one who is creator of space and time. He is limitless. We say here, these faces that will look, they are looking for God's mercy. They are hoping for God's forgiveness. And they know that they will attain it or they, they have hope in it. Whereas we have other faces, that it says found in, in verse 24, that faces are uh, despondent or frowned, so to speak, frowning faces on that day. In chapter 80, we are told that another interesting dis uh, description of the faces of the Day of Judgment is in verse 38 till 41. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وُجُوهٌ يَوْمَ إِذٍ مُسْفِرَةٌ Their faces will be full of beaming light on the Day of Judgment. ضَاحِكَةٌ مُسْتَبْشِرَةٌ Subhanallah. That the faces will be laughing, smiling, happy of glad tidings, joyful, so to speak. Further description. So can you, hopefully in the last few verses, you've seen now a number of descriptions of the faces uh, of, of, of the believers and the disbelievers of the sinners and those who have been uh, forgiven by the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala and the righteous. This says that their faces will have dust on them or will have some kind of soil on them. Uh, it will be, again, quite a depressing state. Tarhaquha qatara, overcast with uh, gloom or unhappiness, so to speak. Ula'ika humul kafaratul Fajara. In uh, Surah al mutaffifin verse number 24, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الْأَبْرَارَ لَنَا لَفِي نَعِيمٌ and talks about the abrar and then uh, speaks and says that their faces, you can see on their faces happiness and the signs of victory. That they indeed have become victorious on the Day of Judgment. In Surah Al-Qamar verse number 48, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَوْمَ يُسْحَبُونَ فِي النَّارِ عَلَى وُجُوهِهِمْ That certain individuals will be dragged towards Jahannam on their faces. On their faces. So that's another description given in the Qur'an regarding the element of the face. Just a final note on that as we're discussing faces and facial expressions and so on as the Qur'an here tells us وَعَنَتِ الْوُجُوهُ لِلْحَيِّ الْقَيُّومِ There are discussions in Islamic ethics regarding how our faces should be in day-to-day -day life. In fact, I found a chapter in book Wasail al-Shia, chapter in the book uh, Al-Kafi and in Bihar al-Anwar, each specifically for facial expression. Entirely, entirely. Can you imagine? In fact, the, the, the book uh, Wasail al-Shia is in volume 13, and the section is called Bab Istihbab Talaqatul Wujhi wa Husn al Bashar. It's the chapter regarding the recommendation to have a beaming face and a smiley expression. Yeah? So let's have a look at a few narrations from Imam al Baqir, from the Holy Prophet of Islam, peace and blessings be upon him and his holy progeny. Somebody came to him and said to him, Ya Rasulullah, Awsini. Give me a recommendations, wasiya, point me towards a particular idea. And the Prophet of Islam gave him a number of recommendations, and one of them was Alqi Akhaka biwajhin munbasit. Meet your brother in a face or facial expression that radiates 
happiness, comfort, tranquility. Yeah, we have a narration also uh, in in Wasal Shia from Imam Sadiq, from the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his holy progeny, which says, "You will not be able to encompass people with your wealth." In other words, win the hearts and minds of people with your wealth. However, at the same time, try your best to win them over with your facial expressions. With uh, uh, a beaming, respectful smile, so to speak, and uh, 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 one that uh, somehow radiates uh, love and compassion and mercy. Yeah? Now, sometimes we find certain individuals, believers, they say, but you know what? We may be going through difficulty or, you know, as a believer, we shouldn't be in that particular state. We should always feel a sense of sadness that we are far away from God and that we have committed so many sins and we're not at the level that it should be. And therefore, don't blame me if I walk around with a frown in my face. You know, because I'm carrying a huge responsibility and that's Iman, I'm not doing enough. Maybe I've committed so many sins and so on and so forth. So I shouldn't be happy, I shouldn't be smiling as we are told that this uh, uh, smiling is a hasana. It brings reward. And the answer to this is a beautiful narration from the Ahl al-Bayt that says, Al-mu'minu bushruhu fi wajhih wa huznuhu fi qalbih. That the believer, their facial expression should radiate happiness and, you know, some kind of mercy. But their sadness should be kept to their heart. Sadness should be kept to their heart. Of course, there are exceptions at times, for example, of mourning, we're told, for example, and other times. But we're talking generally speaking, because sometimes you see people continuously, you know, their, their, their face, facial expression is that of frowning or, you know, or upset or are you okay? No, I've done all these things. Islam wants us to be living in society in a cohesive manner, but also to radiate that kind of strong bond and uh, association and relationship in the best possible way. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us achieve this and to grant us success and tawfiq wa akhir da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala muhammad wa alihi at-tayyibin at-tahirin